So we are now open for questions, both um, both online and in person here. It'll take maybe about 10 minutes or so. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, I'm Jose Pagan, and I just want a little bit of a comment on the last uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I really hate Greg a lot because I had a roller coaster of emotions through that. I'm Puerto Rican. Uh, we absolutely adore the moon. The moon is our like our goddess. It is everything that is Puerto Rico. And everything you were mentioning was hitting me strong. I was holding back tears. And um, I'm even wearing my Puerto Rican. Uh, best way, here's a joke. Best way to find out someone's Puerto Rican is they'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> but um, one thing I will say is please petition Puerto Rico. If you ask Boricuas, we will come. We will fund everything. Like we will be there. There is more statistics show that more Puerto Ricans are leaving than actually live in the island anymore. So please, please, I'm, I'm, if I can, please, everybody, like please help, please support Puerto Rico. We are a strong community. We've gone through adversity, gag laws, every, anything on like under the sun, but we still manage to stay together through adversity, out of people falling, everything, but. I am here because of Addis Evil. And sorry. <laughs> yeah. So right. I want to say thank you. And I, I look forward to being a part of that. that yeah. e email that, that janky Gmail account we have. But we want your voice in this, right? We do. And I think particularly with the effect of Arecibo on Puerto Rico, um, I think this is an opportunity for us to really highlight a lot of voices that are often aren't heard. So please email that Gmail account. Let's get your voice into this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Can I uh, just follow on from Paul there? Um, I have a first year graduate student that just started with me, been here a year from Puerto Rico. And she is a self-starter and she, uh, she is going to be involved with this as well. So there's two Puerto Ricans already involved. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I see how passionate she is as well. So... Yeah. Oh. Hey. <laughs> exactly. Bring bring it all. That's uh You are welcome. <laughs> Very welcome to join this. I uh, Pamela Gay PSI. Uh, there are actually several of us in the room who are survivors of the 2009 International Year of Astronomy, which LRO and L Cross were a major part of. And our network at the IAU from the International Year of Astronomy still exists. The partnership still exists. My cornerstone project is still going 15 years later. We are here for you. And I'm going to regret saying this. I'm the IAU OAO National well, Organizing Person. Email so okay, cool. hi, we're here. <laughs> and and I, I, you know, the list of, of, of folks there cannot be exhaustive but the iu is a perfect example and, and the infrastructure they have internationally is yeah absolutely i i just want to comment on that that uh when the nlsi was less than a year old um i we brought on doris dow as our uh, education and public outreach lead um and, and she said um before she and i had ever even met we had a phone call and she said greg what would you think about getting involved in the international year of astronomy and I said, hell yes. And we, we were there at both the opening and closing ceremonies, and it was absolutely wonderful. I appreciate you bringing that up. And this, this I think, is going to be even better for this community in particular. Parvati? Hi, uh, Parvati Prem, APL. Um, also about Ailey, comment rather than a question. Um, and I've forgotten what it was. Oh, I remembered. Uh, so, uh, so, Paul, you mentioned that Things are going out in the pen, all our usual news newsletters. Um, that's great. I think, you know, as far as like within the, the US is concerned, it might also be worth considering uh, reaching out to some of the other sort of professional societies. So science and technology studies. Um, there's an international association for the study of the commons that's interested in space. And, you know, kind of building on Jose's point, but but this is, this is different. Um, Again, from the U.S. standpoint, uh, like, you know, the U.N. works mostly with nation states, but there's, you know, international conventions on the rights of indigenous people. And I think, you know, especially in the U.S., it would be really powerful to, I think, also reach out to native nations. And that sort of needs to be done um, in the same way you would reach out to a foreign government. And because I think, you know, like I love grassroots stuff, but also I think 
sometimes you miss voices when you rely purely on grassroots efforts. And so sort of thinking strategically about where you need to sort of actively invite people in and sort of do things a little bit more formally. I think, you know, ironically, we sometimes think that, you know, calling for grassroots volunteers is the most inclusive way to do things. But, you know, sometimes that's not because not everyone is going to feel invited if we if we're just like, who wants in, but very excited about it. You know, that's a point really well taken. And and something that we've been, and I didn't, for the interest of time, I skipped it. The way we we think this is going to work in terms of the mechanics is that a number of countries will bring this through the co-ops committee, and then it goes to the General Assembly for a vote. Um, we have been working to the extent, I mean, I was saying this to Andy at lunch, to, to go from a bunch of, you know, regular scientists to saying, we're going to go to the UN. I don't even know where the UN building is, somewhere in New York. I don't know how to do that, but we have people who are helping us. And the plan is that we would love to find a few countries to do this, perhaps not ones um, that necessarily have had a, a long history of space exploration. The United States is not leading this. And the State Department has been very aware, I think, and clear that this can't be seen to be, and it, it shouldn't be, a US-driven thing. Um, which means that in parallel, we'll be working with people in different nations, including First Nations peoples, Aboriginals, folks who were, you know, Native Americans, and there's a lot of indigenous folks around the world, partnering with them on an international scale, but also within a, the, within North America, for example, as well. So I think you're you're absolutely right, and and part of what we're looking for is advice and then feedback on who should we be reaching out to, in addition to soliciting grassroots involvement, right? So to try and get those voices because, you know, the moon, like you know, is is foundational, right, to everybody. Um, so we have to be, be really clear that we're not leaving anyone out. It's all about the moon, just saying. <laughs> Absolutely. Parvati, I just want to add, too, that uh, we at Serbi just adopted a uh, Navajo school, thanks to the foundational work that Brian Day has done for the last um, 15 years. I was there for the adoption ceremony. We have a long relationship with that uh, particular nation and and um, your point is is very very well taken um, and and as Paul said each each group has its own view on on what the moon is and we need to have respect for all of those views so not to put a bump uh, downer on this but what do you do when you encounter for example tribes of uh, first nations or entire cultures that think we should not go to the moon and we should not send anything there how do you bridge that gap? I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that if we don't make an effort to engage with folks, we're not being true to the spirit of exploration, right? Which is to bring everyone with us. Um, you know, th there is a, there's a, a longstanding argument that going out into space is a colonial mindset. And I think that's something that we don't talk about enough. So I don't know. Um, I have the luxury of not having to know, but I know that if we bring scholars and artists and politicians and researchers and historians and you name it together, at least we can have that conversation, even if it doesn't ultimately lead to a change in what the big nations are doing. Yeah, I absolutely agree. That's This is what the ILY is set up to do, is to bring those divergent opinions together and look for consensus. That's the that that's the point of it, and that's coming back to what Pravati was saying is is the yeah we need to make sure that everybody is feels that they are they can come and be part of this. So that's the that's the goal, and now we've we're, we're working on mechanisms to make that goal a reality, and it, and it's up to you know up, up to us to be open minded and not entrenched in how we're going to move forward with this. I would agree. I, I think um, engagement is the most important thing and open conversations. The the If we look at the example of the Peregrine launch and the concerns that were brought forward by the Navajo Nation about human remains going to the moon, the biggest problem involved in that wasn't that we were going to the moon. It was that nobody talked to them and we had an agreement that we would talk to them. So having conversations and engaging respectfully is 
really important and there's a lot of value that we can't control what people think or feel about it, but we can, we can talk with them and show them that respect. Well, well said, Kathy. Brian. Yeah, Brian David Nassasurvey. Um, having worked with the Navajo Nation quite a bit through L Cross and uh, Peregrine, uh, we have to keep in mind that as we deal with the great diversity of cultures that we have here on Earth, that none of these cultures are any more monolithic than we are. And what we can best hope to do is to foster discussion and involvement amongst us within their communities. Uh, with the Elcross mission, there was a great divergence of opinion within the Navajo Nation. And uh, it was really intriguing for me to hear at one point in a very vociferous debate to hear the president of the Navajo Nation stand up and say that at some point he would love to see a Navajo astronaut conducting a Navajo ceremony on the surface of the moon. Um, we're going to encounter a great divergence of opinions. That's the nature of us. But getting that discussion going is hugely important. That's what this International Year of the Moon should be about. Yep, amen. Okay, one last question and then we'll need to move on, please. I'm not sure this is a question maybe so much as a recommendation or maybe just my anxiety. But <laughs> as I'm listening to what is a really exciting discussion, it was impressed upon me that our job and responsibility is also to educate ourselves and not force or expect those who already have the knowledge to, to spoon feed it to us. And I would love some way to make sure that as this becomes more global and includes more, or more voices that are less frequently heard, that we still have keep, keep the integrity of, of responsibility and, and how we might promote those resources so that we're active listeners and not and, and not just uh, reaping the fruits of others' labors. I totally agree. And I want to riff both on what you've said and also, Brian, what you said. You know, this is an intern, the vision we have at least so far in, the, in our group, and it will evolve as we get bigger, is an international lunar year, not an international lunar science year. And an important point there is that in addition to, because the exploration question is a, is a, a perhaps one of the core questions, but we want to have to, we want to make sure that we're we're approaching this with humility. It's not scientists educating the world about the moon. It's that's a part of it, right? But another part of it is us learning about you know what Puerto Rico how they view the moon, how the Irish view the moon, right? And more most importantly, you know, you even if there's an issue, a, 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 you know, a, a, a contention between the exploration of it versus retaining the moon as a sovereign place that you know, we'd look at from afar. That doesn't stop us using telescopes to look at it or talking about songs that celebrate it, right? That's what this should entail. So I think I hear you. I think we all hear what you're saying. And it, it's not an international lunar science year. The science is a part of it. And right now it's being led by scientists because that's who David Reinecke emailed and, and Shanghai into doing this. Um, but legitimately, we want this to encompass a broad multitude of perspectives and skills and disciplines and perspectives. That's the only way this is going to work. And and the scientists will be educated because the blinkers will come off rather than focusing on what we do. The blinkers will come off and other perspectives will be allowed through this process to be heard and impact maybe the what the way we think about the moon. And th this is the open-mindedness and, and getting getting in, you know, everybody involved or at least giving them the opportunity to have a voice is important so yeah f fully with you uh, and I, I i i i am sure i'm going to be educated in this process 
And everybody should come in with that mindset. What can I learn from these people? What can I learn? Not what can I teach? It's what can I learn so that I can become a better educator? How is, how is this going to work? Because I've now got a different perspective. I'm looking here, and now I have a perspective from over here that could be game-changing for the way I look at, I, I teach, or the way that I, I do, I, we, we do our thing, so to speak. So, so uh, this is an, ex I, I find this incredibly exciting. You know, I just wish I was 10 years younger, but, uh, <laughs> but that's uh, maybe 20, maybe 30. But, but, uh, but, but again, open-mindedness is key to being inclusive and not having presupposed ideas of how to bring this together. So I was listening to Kathy's talk and he said, you know, and, and, we need to get together and come and come in and bring the, the prospecting international prospecting campaign with the international volatile strategy. That should be part of it. And and I was thinking, I had this question at Space Resources Roundtable. Well, the mines are going to go in there, they're just going to rip it all out and we're going to lose the science. No, that's not how it works. Think of it this way. Lunar scientists need to be part of mining companies. And we think of it, I, I think about it like like construction in Europe. They start clearing a site for construction. They come across an archaeological site and they stop. And it gets preserved. It gets documented. It gets documented and everything, everything we learn from that. That's the approach we should take to utilize resource utilization on the moon is that we find something scientifically interesting. We're going to stop in that area because we need to do it, but we need the scientists to be embedded in that process so that that can be recognized before it's destroyed or it is tainted. And it feeds back into what Kathy's saying about the international volatile strategy for the moon. So this could all be part of the international lunar year discussions with other stakeholders. Yeah. And, and Clive, I just want to, I think the words you said a few sentences ago about every voice is important. That is a perfect way to to close this uh, session, and and uh, we have a little bit more for the conference, but uh, but that's that's what this community, and that's what Survey is all about. So um, wonderful! I want to thank our uh, our three speakers here for three fabulous talks. Thank you so much. Thank you.